being this is Palm Sunday, and this portion of Scripture is only a, only a part of our message today, but I do want to read it to you as we, as we see that uh, Christ came back to Jerusalem and how he was greeted as he came to Jerusalem. So in, in uh, Luke chapter number 19 and verse number 28, Luke 19 and 28. Now your Bible may say the triumphal entry of Christ, uh, but I, I really don't see that as his triumphal entry. I see it as his, as his, first, as his beginning of his uh, death march to the cross of Calvary. Now certainly this same crowd that we're going to read about here in a minute uh, that recognized him for who he was uh, just a few short days would nail him uh, to the cross. And when he had thus spoken, verse 28, and when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. It came to pass when he was come nigh to Beth, Bethphage and Bethany of the mount called the Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples saying, Go ye into the village over against you in the which that you are entering. Ye shall find a colt tied whereon yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Uh, thus shall ye say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way and found, even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the, owner, the owners therefore said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they sat Jesus thereon, and as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitudes of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, Rebuke thy disciples, and he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Father, we thank you for the word of God this morning. Blessed I pray, and God, as we read other scriptures, I pray that we would rightly divide the word of truth. Help us now, God, to see, God, that we are coming, Lord, as we've been preaching to the end of your life, God, and the, and the fulfilling of scripture, God, and the sin day, debt that is being paid, God, we pray, God, you'd help us to realize, God, that you paid it all. Help us now, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, other scripture tells us, I believe in the book of Matthew tells us, that not only did they cast their clothes, but they cast palm branches in his way. And they let him come, they let him enter, and they saw him and believed that he was and he is the king. But however, just a few short days, because he did not immediately set up his kingdom, uh, they were looking for that Messiah, and because he did not do that, and because of, of uh, you know, because of, of uh, the way that he entered and what he came to do, then they rejected Jesus as their king. A friend, today I want to title our message today, The Last Steps of the Savior. The Last Steps of the Savior. Now, I've got a lot to say in a short time. So therefore, if we don't get it all finished, you'll have to come back tonight, and I'll finish the message tonight. But we see in, as, we, as we read these scriptures, and there's many more, as we read these scriptures, we've got to remember when we hear and when we remember the, the life of Christ and we remember uh, the suffering of Christ and we remember what he did on this earth and how his life ended, we must remember these two things. Number one, that Jesus is the Son of God. Amen. He is God in himself. He is also as much fully God as he is fully man. Now, friend, he had a body like I've got a body, like you've got a body. He had a body of flesh that felt pain, that felt suffering. He had a mind, even though he had the mind of Christ, he also had the, the mind of a human because he is God in the flesh. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. The book of the Gospel of John explains to us how that God himself came down to this earth in, in flesh so that he could pay my sin debt. Oh, what a Savior have I in the Lord Jesus Christ. So in these steps of Christ in his life, we saw the many miracles that Christ 
had done. We saw that he raised uh, the dead. We saw that he uh, healed the sick. And we saw all the manner of miracles that he did while he was upon this earth. But now comes the time when he comes to fulfill the plan that he came to do. Amen. The time has come. And Jesus as a man, we see him as he walked in his steps. And we begin our journey here as he, as he entered into Jerusalem. And then we'll continue on and look that, that in the next few verses he weeps over Jerusalem because of his burden and because of the love of his people. And then we see that, uh, uh, that he has many uh, parables that he does here in the way. And then we see that as he questions the scribes and the Pharisees, and we see on that he, that he institutes the Lord's Supper and that Jesus announces his betrayal. This is all happening just, uh, just a days before he is crucified on the cross. And he institutes the Lord's Supper and then he announces that Judas is going to betray him. One of his own is going to tell the, uh, tell the Romans where he's at and he's going to show him where he's at. And he's going to kiss the Son of God and yet die and go to hell without come that close to heaven. Yet he died and went to hell because of his betrayal of Christ. Oh, my friend, we ought to look and learn today. And we ought to know today that it's possible that we get close to salvation but never attain salvation. People get close to being saved and yet never call upon the Lamb of God. And they die and go to hell without God. That man I was telling you about in the nursing home, I've said it several times, how he was on his dying days, and I'd go to him and I said, Sir, wouldn't you like to be saved? And he'd come this close, and he'd say, Not today, preacher, not today. And as far as I know, the man died and went to hell without God because he got that close. And Judas got that close, yet he died and went to hell. He walked with him. He talked with him. He had supper with the Savior. He dined with him, yet he died without Christ. Judas betrayed him. And then we turn on and we see that, that Peter denies him. Jesus predicts his denial, the denial of, 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 of uh, Peter. He, den he, he tells of, that Peter denied him, and Peter did deny him. Peter, the one that walked with him. Peter, that one that walked on the water. Uh, you know, he was very impulsive, yet when it comes to the day of, the, of, uh, of acknowledging that he knew the Lord, he denied Christ. You say, I'd never do that. Peter probably said that too. But friend, I'm going to tell you something. We deny Christ when we don't live for Christ. And Peter denied Christ that day. And now we find Jesus as he comes, as we continue on his, his steps, we see him as he comes to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now I've been there in that Garden of Gethsemane. I know it's wonderful, friend, to go there and to walk in the place where Jesus walked. And as he led his disciples, Peter, uh, uh, Peter and John, James and John, as he led them with him to the Garden of Gethsemane, see, that was a place that he frequented all, all, often to pray. He frequent. I'm going to have to slow down. I cannot get these words out quick enough. Amen. Lord, help me. But I've got things trying to come out, and I'm just going to have to slow down. Is that all right? I hope so, because I'm going to. But as he took those three and he went into the Garden of Gethsemane, a place that he frequented often so that he could what? Pray. Now, friend, the importance of prayer is so great that Jesus determined that he must do it often and that he must do it sometimes all night long. He prayed because he needed to talk to the Father. If Christ had need of prayer, how much more do we have need of prayer in our life? But as he went there in the Garden of Gethsemane, he went there and he went in agony. Now remember, he was God, but remember, he was man. Now how many of you ever had fear in your heart? I mean, I mean dreadful fear in your heart that something was going to happen or, or that something was happening in your life that it caused you great fear in your life. About everybody here has. If you've not, you've got it coming. Because there'll come a time in your life when you'll probably fear for your life. As a little boy as I was, I was riding down the road in my bicycle, and I ain't about 12, 13 years old, maybe. How old are you, Eli? I might not have been much older than him. So we use Eli. I ride my bicycle. You know where I was going? I was going to church. 
And I, and I often I rode my bicycle to church. Eli, I don't get no idea. But often I'd ride my bike to church or I would walk to church. And then, and then it was no big deal. Mom and Dad didn't think a thing about me uh, riding that mile to church, you know, or walking that mile to church. Sometimes I'd walk through the woods to get to church. I had a trail, went right to the church, and I'd walk the woods and get to the church. No big deal. Well, this particular day I was riding my bicycle to church on Wednesday night, and I got about halfway there, and this car pulled up beside me. And I knew who was in the car, I, so I pulled over, you know, to let him by. And I pulled over, and he looked, pulled right up to me, and he looked at me, and, and, uh, and uh, he reached his, his hand to the side of the, uh, uh, where he was sitting in the car, and he pulled out a pistol, and he put it right there. And I'm 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, and I know what a gun to do. I, you know, I've been around guns all my life. I know, you know, I know they'll kill you. And he said, how, how fast can you ride on that bicycle? I said, uh, pretty fast. And he said, well, you better get to riding. Now, you're talking about fear in a little boy's heart. I was fearful. And I mean, it scared. I mean, it scared me. I thought, well, you know, I, I, I'm gonna get shot right here. I'm gonna get killed. And so I didn't take off. I knew if I moved, I'd probably gonna go. So if I was gonna go, I'm gonna go right there. And so I just eased over to the side and and watched him and watched that gun pointed in my face. And and I, you know, I don't know. I don't remember if I was praying. I probably was. But I, the, the fear in my heart cannot be described as what happened at that time. The, you just can't. If, you, if you've never been to that place where you fear for your life and you know that just in a moment of time that you may be in eternity, if you've never had that, you know, uh, I, I, I hope you don't. But I'm telling you, it's a dreadful fear. Finally, the man, he grinned and laughed real big and threw the gun back down in the seat and off he went. And oh, my, was I ever relieved. And to make a long story short, he was caught later, and they found him, and guess what? The gun was loaded. Guess what? The safety was off. And I come that close to being taken out of here by a man that was out of his mind with drinking. Now, friend, that's dreadful fear. I don't know if you've ever had experience like that. I've had other such experience, but not that quite that drastic. But I've had other times when I fear for my life. Think about Christ. He was man. He knew, listen, I didn't know what was going to happen in the next few minutes, but God, but Jesus being man and yet fully God, he knew exactly what he was about to suffer. And as he went there to the Garden of Gethsemane, the man part of him said, Dear Lord, if it be thy will, let this cup, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me, the cup of suffering. That man part of him, he saw what he was going to face, but he looked at the Father and said, Father, not my will, but thine be done. All the agony that he suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane. There's trees over there that they, one tree in particular, I've got a picture where they said it's at least 2,000 years old. It was probably there most likely when Christ was walking in the Garden of Gethsemane. I walked in that garden and remembered what Jesus had done for me. I want to tell you something, friend. It touches my heart. It touched my soul to know that 2,000 plus years ago, Christ himself walked in that garden and he had me on his mind. Hallelujah. Oh, thank God you remember that 2,000 years ago when he prayed in that garden, he was praying for me. He was praying for you, amen. That why? So that we can know, to could believe on him and be safe and not die and go to hell without God, amen. So in great agony, he prayed in the garden. And he prayed until the Bible tells us right here. Let me read it. <coughs> <coughs> In, in chapter number 22, <clears throat> verse 39, And he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And he went as at that place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, said, Father, if thou, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. That angel came 
for not the God part of him, but for the man part of Jesus, that angel came and strengthened him. That's how much man he was. But it had to be a perfect lamb. It had to be a perfect man that would, that would give his life for you and me. That would be that sacrifice. So I can imagine that perfect man, Jesus Christ, in that garden of Gethsemane with all the dread and all the fear of death that came upon him that day, that great burden knowing that he would become my, that he would become sin for me, that he would carry my sin dead. Oh, hallelujah, friend. I'm glad there was a perfect man that would give his perfect life so this unperfect sinner could be saved in the grace of God. Hallelujah. Well, glory. He prayed for me. And that angel come and ministered to him. And he got down and as he was praying, as he was calling out to God, the Bible tells us this. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Oh, my friend, can you imagine being in such agony? And there has been several instances that have been noted throughout history where people have been in such anguish and such pain and in such agony of mind, such agony of distress, that there, that there were, would ooze from their sweat glands, ooze from their pores, blood and sweat mingled together. Friend, this wasn't a pleasant sight. This wasn't something that would be easily to be held. But he, as he suffered for me, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, even the agony that was going through him, knowing that what was going to happen, but he suffered until his sweat became as great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Oh, my friend, today Jesus did it all. Jesus did all of that with me on his mind. And listen, friend, he never missed a step. We're following the steps of Christ. We're following the last steps of the Savior to the cross of Calvary. And when he got through in the garden of yeah, hallelujah, he had power, he had the strength that God gave him as a man. And guess what? He never backed down. Even in the garden of Gethsemane, he as a man never backed down from paying my sin debt. Oh, my. He didn't have to go through all that. No, 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 I'm not worth that. You're not worth that. We all ought to be in hell today. Every one of us should be in hell today because of our sin, because of what we are. We're sinners saved by God's grace, but I'm not in hell because of Jesus, amen? And I'm not going to hell because of the price that Jesus paid for my salvation, amen? Oh, what a Savior, what a Lord. Jesus paid it all as he went on to Calvary. He, we see that his steps in the garden his suffering in the garden was solitary suffering. He suffered alone for you and I. We see in verse 44 that it was intense suffering, that he, his blood became as great, uh, as his sweat became as great drops of blood because Jesus knows what lies ahead. Jesus knows the coming ahead of him is he's going to be betrayed. He knows that he's going to stand at the judgment hall of Pilate. He knows that he's going to be mocked and ridiculed. He knows that he's going to be forsaken by his own. He knows that he's going to be beaten beyond recognition with a cat of nine tails. That part of the man God knew that, and he knew what his body was going to suffer as a man. Yet guess what? He said, I'm going to, I'm going to because I love them. I love sinners. I've lived my life for them, and I'm going to suffer these things for. He knew the suffering of the cross. He, he knew the nails through his hands. He knew the crown of thorns upon his head. He knew that that would be placed down upon his skull until those, those, uh, those thorns in that crown of thorns were pressed down into his skull. And he knew the pain and anguish of that would. If you don't believe that that will hurt, you come up here and you just lay it on your head and push down just a little bit. The excruciating pain of just the crown of thorns, friend, he would not, he would not back down. He would not back down from the, from, the, from the suffering that his natural body was going to have to have. He wasn't going to back down. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, he went through all of that knowing the dreadful agony of the things that was uh, going to, be, to become him. It was a prayer that was earnest prayer. And it was a submissive prayer 
of the divine will of the Father. Not my will, but thine be done. That's what he said. And friend, it's because of Jesus. It's because of the will of the Father that Jesus went on to the cross and carried my sins with him and became sin for me. Hallelujah. Hey, man, I'm glad. Oh, glory, I'm glad for the cross. Or else I'd be in hell today and you would too. Thank God for the cross. Then we see that his steps, as he, as he, was, as he was walking, his steps lead us to Pilate's Hall in chapter number 23. And I'm just going to read a few verses. Verse number 3 tells us in chapter 23, And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it. You said it, Pilate. I am the king of the Jews. Now this irritated Pilate. He didn't, he didn't believe that Jesus should call himself the king of the Jews. However, it was sitting over his cross. This is the king of the Jews. And I believe to this day, amen, that he believed that that's who Jesus really was. He knew in verse number 4, Pilate knew of the faultlessness of this man. And then said Pilate to the chief priest and to the people, I find no fault in him. Pilate examined him. Pilate looked at him, and he couldn't see any fault in the Savior that they would want to crucify him because they were crying, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said, I find no fault in this man that he should be crucified. Uh, Pilate, you know, he, 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 in verse number 11, Pilate, he says, and Herod with his men of, of war set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous road and sent him again before Pilate. Pilate sends him to Herod. Herod says, you know, we, we don't know what to do with him. We're going to send him back to Pilate. So Herod mocks him. And they put a scarlet robe upon him in mockery. I'm talking about the king of kings. I'm talking about the Lord of lords. They put a, a, a scarlet robe upon him. And they mock him. And they send him back to Pilate. He gets before Pilate. And Pilate says, all right, it, it's a custom. I'll release somebody to you. And, and so here's Barabbas. And here's Jesus. Who do you want to? Who do you want me to release unto you? And and Barabbas was one of the most wicked men of that day. He was a murderer and and was guilty of all kinds of crime. And he was a, he was scheduled to be crucified. He was scheduled for execution. And the people knowing how mean and how wicked and how evil Barabbas was, and yet they hated Jesus so that they said, "Give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas." And so, and, and so <clears throat> Pilate had no choice but to give, us, give them Barabbas as they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate re released Barabbas un unto the people. And then again, he scourged Jesus and he sent him away to be crucified. He beat him, had him whipped because he thought maybe this will satisfy them. So they laid Jesus down and they, they put, tied him up to the whipping post. And friend, that whipping post was a was a very evil thing. And they were they pulled him up to that post and stretched his hands and stretched his body. And they laid the cat of nine tails across his taut back, across the skin on his back 39 times. And they laid the, the, the whip around him till he till his you know, till he was beaten beyond recognition. You couldn't tell when he was crucified. You could not tell that he was a man. He did that. Why? Because he loved me. You remember all the time now that he is God, but you remember that he is man. Friend, he suffered just like you did. He would, It hurt just like it would hurt me or just like it would hurt you. Yet he did it because, hallelujah, he loved me. Amen, he loved me. Brother James, he loved me. Amen. He loved me, Brother David. He loved me. And yet he was willing to take that beat that should have been mine. You remember, Christ deserved none of this. I deserved it all. But he took my place. Hallelujah. But he suffered that. Many men died at that whipping post, but it wasn't time for Jesus to die. That wasn't the way that he would pay my sin debt. Not at the whipping post of man. Not at the whipping post of, of sinners. He was not to pay my sin debt like that. You remember all along, Jesus did not die by, man, by the hand of man. He died because he willingly gave up the ghost. Amen. They can say all they want to that men killed him. They didn't kill Jesus. He gave his life for me. That was a willing sacrifice that he would give his life for me. 
to fulfill the perfect type of a willing sacrifice of a perfect lamb. He releases Jesus to be crucified. I may get through yet. Then we see as he is released to be crucified, we see that his steps to Calvary. We see in his steps to, uh, to, to the crucifixion, we see his steps to Calvary. How that along that trail, along that way, as he is bearing the cross, and as his body begins, it becomes weak because remember, he is God in the flesh. He is a man, and his body becomes weak, and, 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 uh, and uh, they call Simon to help him bear that cross. But as he continues on to the cross of Calvary, we, we see here that on the way that they would spit in his face. Men, how many, how many times would it take someone to spit in your face before you, before you become righteously indignant? Or just old fleshly mad. I know why nobody sits up on these seats right here, and I know why Joe sits way over there. <laughs> because they don't want to be spit upon, and I let it fly sometimes when I'm a preaching. So they stay their distance. That's why I come back, maybe some of you get on you once in a while anyway. But I will tell you something. How many times would it take for someone, amen. Brother John, how many times would it take for someone to walk up to you and just spit in your face? About one time, that's right. And then what would happen? A fist, a fist applied to that nose or that mouth that spit it, right? But Jesus, hey, listen, friend. Jesus, when he walked along, they would, they would cough up and spit in his face. I know that's gross, but listen, the things that happened to Christ were not pleasant at all. And they would spit in his face, and yet he, would, he, he went on. As a sheep is dumb before his shears, Christ went to the cross of Calvary, and as he went to that cross, he never mumbled a word. He never, he, you know, he could have said, this is enough of this. Father, send 10,000 angels, send legions of angels to come down here and get me out of this. Or he could have just spoken the word and said, that's it, I'm wiping everybody out, and I'm done with it. And he would have been right because he is a just and holy and right God. He would have been right to do that. Yet he did not because he loved me. He did not call it off because that he loves you. Amen. That why he went on as they spit in his face and as they mocked him in mockery and they bowed and they pointed and laughed and yeah you're the king I can imagine on the way and then they got him to that place called Calvary and they got him to that place of the skull now you see in pictures you see the place of the skull I've got many of them and, and, and as you look at that as you stand and look at that place of the skull you see it and it does resemble a skull. You can tell exactly what it is. So when you see the pictures, that's real. But that's the place called Golgotha. And down, down below that hill, down below that mountain, there's a road that runs along that mountain, or along the edge of that mountain, the highway there. And there is where they crucified the Son of God. They crucified him there because it was a place of traffic where many people walked by. They would crucify people there, and sometimes they would hang there for days and days and days. But there they crucified the Son of God, and people from all around came and gawked on him, came and saw that he was there and that he was going to be crucified. And Christ willingly laid his life down. He laid back on that cross that they had prepared for him. He laid back on that cross, and with his great outstretched arms of love, he, said they let, he let them drive those nails through his hands. He let them pound those nails through his feet all the time, all the time knowing that he was doing it for me. He was doing it for you. And they nailed him to that cross, and then those Roman soldiers taking the body of Jesus on that cross. They picked that cross up from the ground and they had a hole down here and they picked it up and it got to the edge of that hole and they stood it up and it into the bottom of that hole. Oh, friend, what agony, what pain, what suffering. I can only, I can only paint a very, a very dim picture of what that must have looked like. I can't imagine how, how that must have felt. But while on the cross of Calvary, Jesus did what he come to do. He was doing it as he did it for me and for you. And he died a horrible death on that cross. Now listen, this does not end the steps of Christ. He's there. He's crucified. He's hanging on that cross. But he is on that cross as he is 
nailed in that the horribleness of that cross, we see some things that's still happening in the life of Christ. We see a thief on the right hand. We see a thief on the left hand. The one on the left hand mocked him. The one on the left hand jeered at him. If, if you're really Jesus, come down off this cross and save us. And the one on the right hand said, Can't you see who this is? His eyes were opened by the Spirit of God. And he looked at Jesus and he said, This is him. This is Jesus. And he looked as he could look at Christ. And he turned his head and said, Will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And that great Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, he looked over at him and said, he said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And on his dying day, he had great compassion for the lost and dying sinner. Oh, hallelujah. I'm glad I know you. I'm glad I know Jesus. He did it for me. If I'd have been there and said the same thing in his dying anguish, the body of a broken man, he looked and said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And guess what? One of these days I'm going to see that old sinner. Amen. Now that gives us, that brings some more questions that prove to me some things in Scripture. Brother Edis, he didn't have to, he, didn't, he couldn't come off that work, that cross and do a lot of work to help pay his way to, to, to heaven, could he? He was there, he died as a repentant sinner. Guess what? He didn't get baptized. So we see baptizing is not a part of salvation. It just shows everybody. Oh my, I can go on and on. But that thief on the cross, he believed by simple childlike faith. And guess what? He's in heaven today. There was also another one at the cross and, and several more. We know, we know that John was there. We know that his mother was there. And, but we know that there was a Roman soldier there that looked on it all. And not all were without compassion. This Roman soldier looked at him and said, Truly, this is the Son of God. Now many people would disagree with me, but I believe that was an admission of who Jesus was. And I believe he had faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe I'll see him in heaven when I get there. You can disagree. That's fine with me. Amen. God will prove it when we get there. But I'm telling you what. Believe. The Bible says what? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And this man not only saw him as Jesus, he saw him as the Son of God and believed. So while on the cross, as his steps ended at Calvary, when he died on the cross for you and I, he, he was still saving sinners. And friend, I'll tell you, it don't, seem, it don't, it don't seem today that nobody's ever going to get saved again. But I believe in the last days, we'll see people call out to Jesus and believe on him. It was their last hope. It was that, it was that thief on the cross. This is his last hope. But he saw the light and was saved. Then we see that there was a great earthquake. We see that there was darkness. Why was there darkness? Because the God in heaven, listen, this was God-man hanging on that cross. This was a man in the flesh, God in the flesh, hanging on that cross. And he became sin for me. My sin, your sin, your sin, your sin, your sin. The sins of all mankind through all eternity. All, listen, when, one, when I commit one sin... How heavy is that on my heart? When you sin one sin, how heavy is that on your heart until you get that thing right with God? I mean, it's agony. It's, it's suffering. If you're truly a child of God now, if sin don't bother you, you need to get saved. I'll just tell you, if you think you're saved today and sin don't bother you, it don't bother you to sin, you need to get saved because I'm saved by the grace of God and I still sin. And when I sin, the convicted spirit of God it gets on me and it hurts and it's a hard load to carry. It's a heavy load to carry. But think of the Son of God. He bore everybody's sin. He who knew no sin became sin for me and for you. He, listen, he was sinlessly perfect. And to have all of that sin of all of mankind cast upon him. And God in heaven, the Father, said, I can't look at it. I can't see him. I can't see the sin upon my sin upon my son and he turned his back upon the son of God and upon Jesus and there was darkness upon the, upon the earth as God turned his back as Christ paid my sin debt 
Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. And he did all of that with you and me. And with the Father turning his back on the Savior. But he finally paid my sin debt. Amen. He finally paid my sin debt. And on the cross of Calvary we see that Jesus paid my sin debt with a, every drop of blood that he had. He paid my sin debt. And when it was all said and done, when my sin debt was paid, when your sin debt was paid, as he hung there on the cross of Calvary, he said, It is finished. Hallelujah. The greatest words in the New Testament, I believe, is those words, It is finished. You know what was finished? Hallelujah, a way was made for my salvation. My sin debt had been paid. And he said, it is finished. And then, what does it say then? He gave up the ghost. It would have never happened until he gave up the ghost. He gave his life for me. He gave his life for you. Oh, they nailed his nail. They, listen, they pierced his side. Blood and water come forth. They put the crown of thorns on his head. They beat him beyond recognition. Where the book of Isaiah says that we wouldn't even recognize him as a man if we looked upon him. His visage was so marred that we wouldn't even recognize him. But he did that, and he hung there, and no matter what they did to him, he would not have died because the Bible said that he gave himself for us. And as he gave himself when it was time, when everything was done, when my sin debt had been paid, hallelujah, when your sin debt had been paid, and when the Father looked and said, that, that'll work, that's, what I, that's a sacrifice that's acceptable, he said, it is finished, and he gave up the ghost. He willingly gave his life for you and I. Oh, my friend today, I can't express you, my words just aren't good enough. I don't have the vocabulary to tell you what great things Jesus has done, but in the way I've tried my best to show you today that Jesus loves you, that Jesus cares for you, and that he died for your sin and for mine. I'm glad this ain't the end of this story, though, aren't you? That may be his steps to the cross. That may be the finality. And listen, when I see a cross like that or a cross like this, I don't want to see nobody on that cross because Jesus ain't there any longer. Hey, man, he bears the, he bear the marks of the cross, but he is not there. Hey, man, he's not in that tomb. And I'm preaching next Sunday morning's message to you right quick, but he's not in that tomb. Thank God he is risen. Hey, man, how did he do that? He did. He, listen, he died by his own will, and he got up by his own will. Amen. I'm glad he said it is finished. And he gave up the, do the, gave up the ghost. His final words as Savior was, it is finished. Father, Lord, I so bless you today. God, I'm glad you paid it all. Lord, I pray right now, God, there's somebody in the building that don't know you. Save them today. Lord, this, there ain't nothing in this world worth going to hell over. God, I pray that you'd save him for Jesus' sake. Amen. While every head's bowed, no one looking around.